is there's a matter of obvious privilege. And it's because we had seen real progress on the technological front. There are now certain several ways to deploy this technology without compromising uh, human confidentiality, uh, com confidentiality or um, client data or proprietary information. Um, as long as it's a, a tool developed inside a firm or a privately developed tool, by that I mean not a tool that is generally free and accessible to the public. Um, so they're now very Hello, everyone. Um, I would like to invite everyone to take their seats. Uh, please don't be shy and come and sit in the front rows as well. Uh, there's um, there's plenty of room. We and we're also going to have plenty of time to socialize and talk after the event. We just we already have people who have joined uh, via the Zoom, uh, so they're already waiting uh, for the event to start. So we wanted to get started relatively on time. But uh, thank you, thank you very much. And uh, we'll come and take take your seats. I'm uh, going to turn it over to to Ben. You probably want to. Okay, thank you everyone for uh, for showing up. Uh, it is the last day of Paris Arbitration Week, so thank you all for uh, waking up and coming, I guess. Um, whoever partied last night, thank you for, uh, for making an effort. Um, so we're here to, to briefly talk about the FBMC AI guidelines um, that we drafted. We're gonna start by making a brief summary. I think uh, you've either seen them or you can see them afterwards. Uh, they're, uh, in our opinion, not groundbreaking, but some so some good guidelines that will will help us guide through the use of AI. Um, with us, we have Marta Garcia Bell from Freshfields, New York. Good to see you. We have Sophia Clot from Clot Arbitration. She just ended her work with, or not ended her work. Sorry, I have to rephrase. Uh, she just became an independent uh, practitioner slash arbitrator with Clot Arbitration. Um, and on stage with us, we have um, Orlando Cabrera from Hogan Lovells, who is part of our SVMC AI guidelines drafting subcommittee, uh, together with uh, Marta and Sophia, as well as Dimitri Fsev, independent arbitrator uh, from London, former partner at Arnold and Porter. I don't know why I always want to say uh, Alan Overy. But uh, no, Arnold and Porter uh, in DC. Um, and of course, with us, we have our um, dear Valerio Letizia. Letizia. Letizia, forgive me, um, associate with Freshfields in Paris. He will give us a little insight on the practitioner's views of, of the use of AI, as well as the submitted comments from Freshfields that uh, we received um, for these guidelines. So uh, without further ado, um, thank you for being here. I'll pass the word on to uh, our dear friend Orlando, who will give us a brief introduction um, and start with guideline one. And then Marta and Sophia will uh, help us go through the rest. 
thank you all for being here. Well, thank you uh, for the introduction, Ben. Um, so you may wonder, why do we need these guidelines? So why the technology is so different? And I would like to start by commenting on a case that you may know, which is Mata versus Avianca, uh, before the Second Circuit, uh, Southern District in New York, uh, where basically some lawyers have the brilliant idea to ask ChatGPT for uh, assistance in preparing a brief. So these lawyers sought the assistance of ChatGPT. ChatGPT uh, helped to prepare the brief. They didn't even review, check citations, and they just submitted the brief. Not surprisingly, a couple of weeks later, uh, the judge tries to find cases and um, the court was unable. So uh, the court asks the secretary of the court of appeals and the cases uh, did not exist. So the court goes back, the judge goes back with the lawyers and the lawyers have to disclose that ChatGPT uh, helped to prepare the brief and those cases were invented. Not surprisingly, they were fine. So, uh, I mean, this is a lack of competence and understanding of the technology. And this is because um, you may not know, but uh, artificial intelligence hallucinates. And what is a hallucination? Well, it's basically that the algorithm was trained or coded in a way to produce a result that sounds plausible, logical, logically, but it's not correct. Um, and, and that's a huge problem for lawyers because for other areas like uh, image creation, video creation, I mean, um, that's not a thing, but for lawyers, we are not supposed to invent cases or create jurisprudence. So this is why we believe that lawyers using artificial intelligence do need to have competence, a basic understanding on the technology. Another aspect to consider is related to um, biases. Um, and, and I will explain, explain with a, a, an assumption, an example that Maxi Scher uses. Uh, let's assume for a moment that in the field of investment arbitration, there, ex there exists a bias against uh, investors. But just let's assume for a moment. Uh, so imagine that we have all cases decided in favor of investors. And then we feed all that information into the algorithm. The result will be that the algorithm will have all that garbage in and produce garbage out. Um, so it will take all the biases and continue to perpetuate the bias in the system. So that's another problem. And we need to be careful uh, when we use the technology that as humans, we have biases and how we deal with biases. And there are many other examples like Tay, which was a Microsoft chatbot that um, was um, fed with all the information from um, Twitter at the time. And uh, not surprisingly, a couple of hours later, they had to shut down the system because it became racist, uh, produced discriminatory comments and so forth. Uh, and the last comment I would like to, uh, the last aspect I would like to underscore is related to um, the black box problem. Um, humans, lawyers are supposed to produce reasons, meaning in the sense that um, we can explain how we reach conclusions, going from A to B, so we reach C. But the algorithm is enabled to produce conclusions because basically, it produces um, probabilistic calculations where there is this word, it's highly likely that the next word will be the following. So it cannot produce reasons. And this is a problem for it. For instance, in investment arbitration, under the exit convention, uh, awards are supposed to have reasons. If awards do not have reasons, then that's a ground for annulment. Uh, however, under the Oncitral uh, model law, parties may agree not to have reasons. But anyways, so these are the type of problems. And this is why we believe that lawyers need to be competent enough to understand uh, the basics of the technology. We are not going to become engineers. We are not going to become savvy people. But this is why the first guideline calls to attention, because it wants to raise awareness that this technology is not a calculator, is not, not an Excel spreadsheet, but something that may be efficient, but we have to be very careful. And that's my first comment regarding guideline one. And I will pass to Sophia or, or Marta that are online to discuss the following guidelines. 
Thank you, Orlando. Um, hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you here today. So I'm going to briefly touch upon guideline two, which you also have up on your screen. Um, and this guideline draws users' attentions uh, to issues associated with AI and confidentiality. Um, specifically, how can we as users avoid feeding confidential data to an algorithm that a vendor or developer um, is, is developing for us? Uh, and to avoid then uh, having the algorithm use that uh, for, for training purposes, right? Um, so, you know, uh, when, when generative AI first came out, this was really one of the main concerns of firms. I would say now, uh, you know, a lot of water has gone under the bridge and not so much. Um, we have seen really a real progress on the technological front. Uh, as you all know, law firms are now, now developing their own in-house generative AI tools that have built-in mechanisms to preserve the confidentiality of client data. Um, but also when we work with external vendors and developers, there are now several ways to deploy this technology without compromising confidentiality, um, client data, or proprietary information. Uh, and this will often be the case if the tool is being developed privately and it's not a publicly and, fr and free, uh, freely accessible tool. So what the guidelines do is they, they call on users to review the AI, AI um, tool's terms of use and its data handling policies so that we can understand if the tool's treatment of data is consistent with any applicable confidentiality, privacy, or data security um, obligations. Let's move on to guideline three now. And uh, I'm not sure if you can read it on the screen. It's a pretty long guideline as currently drafted, and it deals with disclosure. Um, by disclosure, we mean whether parties and whether arbitrators should uh, disclose the use of certain AI tools during the arbitral uh, proceeding. And this was by far the most controversial issue during the drafting process. Now, inside the task force, we all had very different views on whether and to what extent someone should disclose the use of AI um, in the context of an arbitration. However, despite we had somewhat differing views, we all did agree uh, that we needed to remain somewhat agnostic and not impose what I would say a blanket, a general duty to disclose any and all uses of AI tools. As you can imagine, you know, we use AI tools now in arbitration for everything. <laughs> um, that would be very problematic. Um, if I may quickly uh, just, yes, just make a remark. Go ahead, Matt. This week has been very interesting because one of the hot topics I think was exactly that, disclosure in international arbitration. So uh, after this brief presentation, we'll talk some more about it. Uh, Dimitri will head us off. And I'm also curious to hear from, uh, from our uh, Freshfields colleagues what their submission was um, and their point of view from a practitioner's point of view, how much um, disclosure there needs to be, if any at all, and so forth. So uh, thank you for that, Sophia. And sorry to barge in. No, no, of course. Uh and, and I think that that goes to an interesting point that we saw um, when reviewing the comments is that there are very, I would say, varied views on the issue. And there is a very definite uh, and clearly identifiable practitioner perspective that is not always the same perspective we've seen from arbitrators and from other groups that are involved in arbitration. So um, looking forward to, uh, to hearing more about that um, towards the end of our presentation today. Um, but as you can see uh, on the screen, they are now uh, in the current version of the draft, which is uh, the one we prepared a few months ago. There are two options uh, with respect to disclosure, option A and option B. One is a bit more prescriptive than the other. Um, and so, uh, as Ben was mentioning, you know, we, we uh, asked for comments from you, from the arbitration community, and the results were quite enlightening. And Ben would tell us a little bit more about that uh, towards the end. Um, I will add though that a few, a few of the commenters uh, said, you know, we should not have a disclosure obligation. And I think that's, that's also something that um, we can debate, we can discuss, you know, whether there should be disclosure to begin with or not. Uh, but ben, ben will lead us on that conversation um, later. 
So I'm gonna um, pass the floor on to Marta, who is going to guide us through guidelines four and five. Thank you, Sofia. And thanks everyone for, for joining us today. Well, as you can see on, on the screen now, uh, guidelines four and five um, are specific pro provisions for parties and party representatives. And guideline four sets out a duty of competence or diligence in the use of AI with a renvoir to the applic applicable um, professional standards. Um, so chiefly, this covers things like checking for the accuracy of AI outputs before incorporating them into pleadings and not blindly copy pasting from ChatGTP or from any other tool, um, like the, the lawyers in the Mata versus Avianca case did. Um, I think that, I mean, aside from rem re the renvoir to the applicable standards, um, this guideline also sets out a minimum um, international standard that um, especially council need to um, respect when they prepare um, pleadings or any document to be submitted um, in arbitration proceedings with the, with the assistance of AI tools. Um, because we believe that, of course, council is um, the best positions to to perform this gatekeeping function, and and it's also in line with with our professional duties. Um, we have um, received different comments on on this guideline. I think that we all agree that this um, is something necessary. Some, some people say that we should all already be doing that, but we have seen that it's not the case always. So um, guideline five then establishes that parties and their representatives should also respect the integrity of the proceedings and the evidence, um, which means that they should not use AI tools, for example, to create fake evidence or manipulate evidence. And manipulation of evidence is now a huge concern, especially with deep fakes which can virtually be indistinguishable from the real thing and where manipulation is not, is not always easy to uncover um, through forensic techniques. And indeed, we have been talking with different um, forensics, forensic experts and um, sometimes it's, it's even impossible to, um, um, to, to find out whether um, an AI product is um uh deep fake or or not um and last i uh, know sorry sophia i think that now you is your turn with the six guideline six let's let's talk about guideline six um guideline six and seven which which marta will cover uh are specific cover specifically the use of ai by arbitrators um, guideline six provides that arbitrators should not delegate their personal mandate to analyze the facts, the evidence, and the law to any AI tool when they're deciding a case. Now, we have to make a, a distinction here. That does not mean that arbitrators cannot use any form of AI. Of course not. That's not what the guideline says. Um, but ultimately, uh, what the guideline establishes is that the product that goes into the award needs to reflect the arbitrator's independent judgment. So while arbitrators can use AI tools to manage information, to analyze data, that use should not replace the human judgment, the responsibility, and the accountability that is inherent um, in an arbitrator's role. Uh, and so this is really a call to action for arbitrators, right? Um, that they must be mindful that they're not inadvertently delegating part of this personal mandate to an AI tool. And to some extent, this is an issue that we have already seen and that has been discussed in relation to the use of tribunal secretaries uh, by, by arbitrators. And when drafting this provision, we have, of course, taken that discussion into considera consideration, this non-delegation rule. I would say that that guideline six is uh, perhaps together with, with guideline three, one of the two provisions that has elicited the most comments um, to date. Uh, with respect to, to guideline six, what we see is there's a real concern, particularly coming from arbitration council, that arbitrators 
might start using some of these advanced generative AI tools rather indiscriminately without understanding them and without disclosing uh, that use. And so many have indicated that they would like to see a higher level of outside scrutiny and policing on how um, arbitrators use these AI tools, um, imposing, for example, a duty of mandatory and affirmative disclosure. Marta, if you would like to yes. discuss guideline seven. Sure, just one, one small comment on guideline six. Um, I think that um, um, with AI tools, it's even more complicated than with tribunal secretaries because with tribunal secretaries, you have a person and you can ask him or her, how did you arrive to this conclusion? Why did you put this and that? While with AI, um, at least um, as they are, I mean, taking into consideration the current state of the art of, of, of AI tools, um, most of them can't explain how they produced a certain output. Um, so this is, this is you know, the main issue here. Uh, also, when it comes to determining the facts, which may be um, uh, very relevant in, in, in a lot of arbitration proceedings, or um, when producing certain outputs that are at the, at the, at the base of the reasoning of, of, the, um, of the arbitral award. Um, and guideline seven, um, it's entitled uh, respect for due process, and it focuses on the arbitrator's use of AI tools um, that would introduce AI generated information from outside the record. And this is, of course, I mean, this reflects the um, a principle that it's not um, established in, in, all, in all jurisdictions. It depends on, on whether um, the rules or a certain jurisdiction, the legislation of a certain jurisdiction allows it. But um, the, the, um, the goal of this guideline um, is to caution arbitrators against relying on material or sources generated by AI that cannot be independently uh, verified. And to the extent that they are used, arbitrators should need to check whether they are accurate or not and also give the parties an opportunity to, to comment on, on that. Um, so here, of course, we should probably add something about what are the appropriate disclosures. Um, so at least to give some practical guidance on um, to understand when an arbitrator should disclose, probably before um, 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 using the AA tool. Um, and before doing that, probably should also um, give the opportunity to the to the parties to to comment on on that. And with that, I think that now I pass it on to Ben. Right? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for for the short introduction. I'm going to make my way slowly back out here. No, let me change the camera view so our colleagues online see this beautiful room and our presenters. Colleagues on on stage, let's call it. There we are. Okay, so um, I briefly wanted to uh, just uh, let everybody know where we are in the process. So as of now, the initial draft of the guideline has been finalized. We submitted it for public consultation um, and consultation for, and I'm gonna move everyone out just one second. Sorry, Marta and Sophia, I hope you guys can forgive me. Um, consultation for institutions is ongoing. So what does that mean is once we come up with the final draft, we're going to continuously ask institutions to submit commentary on how to use the guidelines within their institutional rules. Um, what we're hoping to avoid, I doubt we will, but what we're hoping to avoid is uh, a thousand guidelines on how to use AI with overcomplicating things uh, rather than having one set that is applicable to different sets of rules. Um, so, and I did want to take this opportunity to introduce, and now here you can see it, they can see it online though. Let me move this down. So the SVAMC AI Guidelines Review Committee. So what we have done is we've taken all the comments that the community has submitted, we've compiled them. We, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Dimitri Fsef helped us compile it. Um, it was a, a relatively large number of comments altogether. Uh, many pages, my understanding is, one tech company actually used AI to submit their comments and we ended up getting around 30 pages, right? Um, so that was uh, interesting. 
our review committee, we compiled a review committee of people from all around the world to help us kind of have a fresher look at it and uh, help us phrase certain things differently to make it more accessible to the wider audience. Uh, one of the things that we were told, and uh, I wasn't a big fan of it, uh, just because I thought that um, we, could, we, we have to change it, was uh, several arbitrators actually said that um, AI is not for them. It's something for, for, for younger people, something. And, and I, it's not that I disagree. I just think that AI is here. It's a tool, just like any other tool, just like any research tool. Um, and it would be unfortunate for people to believe that it is exclusive of them because of the way we phrase the guidelines. So um, we have compiled this review committee, which consists of, if the clicker works, and now we decided not to. So give me one second. I'll be walking back and forth, but we'll make it work. Sooner or later, we'll make it work. Here we go. Okay, so now it works. So the, the guidelines review committee is consistent of Amy Andicott uh, from the West Coast, Arnold Porter, right? Mr. Dimitri, yeah, just making sure. Uh, we have Gaila Gehring Flores from Allen and Overy in DC. We have Sofia de Sampaio Hayes from um, Armesto and Associates in Madrid. We have Rebecca Mosquera from um, Reed Smith in New York. We have Mr. Alexis Moore out of Paris here. Um, Anibal Sabater, Chaffetz Lindsay. Professor Dr. Maxi Scher out of London and Queen Mary, thank you. Um, Karim Youssef, and I think the last person will be cut off because of all of you, but I hope, uh, yeah, give me one second for all of you. Online, you saw it, please don't give it away. But uh, no, let me move this. Sorry, you will disappear for a second from our screen. Here we are. So our uh, last but definitely not least, uh, I put it in alphabetical order. So there's no first, second, or last is, uh, here we go, make this happen. Eduardo Suleta from uh, out of Colombia. So this will be our review committee. They will finalize the comments, see what we have submitted, see what we could potentially phrase differently in order to make the guidelines more comprehensive and usable. Um, and uh, date-wise, we will publish the guidelines end of April. So we will move fast. We will be the first. Um, and I will just make a side note. The reason we uh, did this under the SVMC was, uh, was twofold. First of all, we believed that an institution needed to back up these guidelines. It couldn't just be some random individuals. Uh, not that my colleagues are not highly esteemed, um, but uh, I, I think in order to get the, the community's backing uh, something needed to be there. The IBA has done a lot. Um, I, you know, we, the IBA just did a lot that was not tech related. So we decided to go to the SVMC who has been uh, very helpful in helping us compile these. So um, this is that. Um, I'm gonna leave this up here. So this is, uh, uh, you know, if, if you wanna find the commentary, there is a link to it. You can also follow updates on the RB City type form um, or send us emails and comments to AI task force at svamc.org. I'll leave it on there for a few seconds. If, if you want to snip a picture or just, you know, let it sink in. Um, but I'm going to take it off so that our viewers on Zoom benefit from uh, uh, these well-dressed colleagues of mine uh, on stage here. Um, I will say this, we, we wouldn't want this to be a one-sided talk. So if at any given point in time, there's questions from the audience, as controversial as you believe, please uh, feel free to let us know. We have uh, two young student, students, right? Both of you, yeah. Two young students from Queen Mary uh, on Paris campus here helping us out. So uh, thank you so much for coming on a Friday um, to help us out. So we do actually have two mics. If anybody has a question, let us know. Here, I'll do the first one. Um, there you go. Thank you. Uh, thank you. First of all, uh, congratulations for this initiative. I, I think it's a very, uh, it's an excellent idea. Uh, that uh, someone takes a lead and try to have a uniform approach. Uh, and the best way to tackle that is through the institutions so that can reach maximum people uh, in the minimum lapse of time. Uh, my name is Christophe Duguay, by the way, for, for those who do not know me. Um, and uh, my question uh, is, in fact, uh, don't you think that's what's more important, and it's not to downplay what, what you're, you're doing, mm -hmm. is what is outside what you're doing? 
uh, I mean, uh, what's important that people know or understand as you did uh, underline it, uh, what is the current stage of AI uh, generative technology. Once they have understood that, meaning that there's no uh, meaning in what uh, this technology does, uh, it does not understand anything. It's uh, converting uh, tokens, i.e. not letters, not words, but uh, combination or part of it into numbers and then calculations on the of, of a probability of occurrence of words to restitute something that we understand as a sentence, but we, in fact, the reader does add sense to, to what is produced by, by the technology. Once people understand that, I, I think they will use it for what is made for. And what we're discussing here is uh, generative for, for text. So it's something that can help you draft something in a sense that it can, it can, it can prepare resumes or uh, summaries uh, or sometimes uh, translations uh, or help you uh, if you have the proper system in place to um, locate information in a vast amount of data. But it, it, it cannot help you to do any reasoning or uh, put sense in whatever document you have. It's for you to do that. So uh, I think it's certainly something that, in my view, is very important. And maybe in addition to the rule, uh, I know it's difficult, uh, and all, all people have to agree, but maybe uh, should there be something to explain what is the state of the technology and what are the points to, to keep in mind when using the technology. Otherwise, you know, if you, if you leave to people uh, to educate themselves, uh, it might be difficult. Some people are with the technology and others will need some guidance. So maybe it's something that could be added to the, the guidelines as such. Thank you. Thanks for the question. I'll, um, now my microphone is on. Um, I'll, I'll let Dimitri take this answer. I'll, I'll, I'll then give you a brief overview of what the task force is thinking about it. So Dimitri, if you want. Uh, yes, I, uh, I'm happy to address this question and, and also make a few other comments that uh, um, came up along the way. Um, I think it's a very valid point. Uh, we have tried in the guidelines, in the comments to the guidelines, uh, particularly in the introduction preliminary section, to outline what we felt were the main sort of failings of the current generation of AI, the things that it, you know, that it tends to do, that it doesn't do well. Um, I have my own views. I, uh, of, of what AI is is good at or, or not good at. I, I do think that potentially the guidelines could benefit from a, a technical annex of sorts that, that goes a little bit more into the technical details um, of, uh, of the different types of technologies that are available. Um, I think back in a year ago when we started with this project, and thank you, Ben, for putting together this, this task force, you know, a year ago when uh, I think a lot of people were not as convinced as they are now that this uh, was going to be, uh, you know, life changing for for a lot of professions. Um, we already then said, look, we're going. We need to explain this. We need to define some terms. We need to um, really give some things for people to consider. Really, almost as um, you know. Uh, factors or issues, the checklist, the mental checklist of things uh, that they need to think about when they're using AI. So I think that was um, a lot of the impetus behind the project, and perhaps it could use more of this type of um, uh, this type of background. In the document, I do think a lot of people find, um, you know, reading some of the uh, some of the comments that we put in uh, into the guidelines and in the introduction, as um, giving an overview, uh, of course, we also understand that the technology is evolving, and uh, you know, in a couple of years or even sooner, uh, some of the things that we take for granted today uh, are are not the case. Um, but I, I actually think that you know what we wrote nine months ago is still very much largely correct uh, and accurate from from the technical perspective. Um, well, I mean, I guess I am biased because uh, I was sort of, a, you know, in a way, a, a technical advisor on, on the committee because I've uh, 
I have a background in um, in technology, and uh, that's a lot of what I do. I spoke last night at a AI developers event, uh, AI engineers event uh, in London, um, and I, you know, I have a focus on um, on AI technology uh, from the technical side as well as from the legal side. So, um, you know, I I want to think that the guidelines do take into account the current state of the technology, uh, but of course they can't take into account every potential use or the way the technology is going to evolve. So a really important thing for us is to make sure that we um, continue improving and we continue, and even after these guidelines are published, that we go and we already start uh, thinking about the next further version, the next iteration. And even though the, the comment period for individuals has officially closed last year, um, we do want the discussion to continue. We want particularly, for example, this group, anyone in this group has uh, comments or thoughts uh, after this session, you're welcome to go. We'll, we'll open up a discussion page. Uh, you'll be able to comment, uh, you know, whether you just have a short comment or a long comment. Uh, or just want to ask a question, uh, we will open up a page, uh, you know, essentially with a discussion thread. Anyone can join, anyone can participate uh, in that. And one of the things we, we wanted to do during this process was to be very open. We, we put out the draft for consultation at the end of August. Uh, it's been, you know, we had several months. Anybody was, you know, could have put in a comment, uh, whether they did or not is another question, but but it was it was completely open. We did receive quite a lot of comments. Uh, quite a lot of them were were very thoughtful. Uh, you know, some were were shorter, saying "great job" or "why do we need these guidelines anyway?" But uh, but you know, but there have been a lot of uh, substantive comments to every provision of the guidelines, uh, and this is what the the review committee that Ben mentioned is is looking at right now. Um, but certainly, we're not stopping there. And uh, we hope that, uh, you know, to, to keep an open mind. Uh, and if it turns out that in practice, uh, something is, is not working out as expected, or people have a real issue with a particular guideline in practice, um, that I think will, um, will be important. And I, I think we should probably turn it over to, to Valerio also to, uh, to say a couple of words uh, about actually feedback on the guidelines and, and from an outsider's perspective, um, or well, someone who has kind of reviewed and, and commented on the guidelines, um, maybe now would be a good time to pass the, pass the baton. Absolutely. Um, first, thank you for that. Thank you for the question. I think it's highly, in, you know, before passing it on to you, Valerio, just, I just wanted to make a few, a few comments. Um, I think it's important that we're all aware of the fact that AI is always evolving. And even what we understood to be AI last year when we started drafting these guidelines is definitely not what AI is today, is not what's going to be at the end of the year and not even in five years from now. So I think it's always just important to, to understand that this is evolving. It is tech and tech is fast of pace. So um, that's why, you know, as um, Dimitri said, we would like to continue a dialogue. So, the, you know, we're going to finalize these guidelines. They're going to be out end of April, but we would want the feedback, the continued feedback from the community. Where does it work? Where does it not work? Why doesn't it work anymore? You know, help us structure these guidelines so that in five years from now, they're not just a static piece of paper that needs updating, but they're actually guidelines that have been updated and that continuously continue to be updated. Uh, and to your point, I did want to say that we are, so within, this is the, the drafting sub subcommittee of the SBMC AI task force. Within the AI task force, we are thinking of doing workshops uh, under what way we, we're not sure yet, but we will be doing some sort of, um, workshops to uh, to help people understand uh, what AI is and, and how it works uh, because mainly AI is a tool it is not um, it's not a brain it's not a body it's it, it won't take any sort of form other than an additional research or working tool and um, of course this is what it is today it's not what, what's got what it might be in, in the next few years but um as Dimitri said and, and may I very briefly just address the comment that technology is evolving but uh, I don't know if you heard recently a, an interview to Sam Altam, the CEO of um, OpenAI, the company that invented the ChatGPT, and they asked whether he envisions that um, uh, ChatGPT 5 will stop hallucinating, will they solve the problem? And he said no. 
for a couple of years, the hallucinations will continue for a while. So it's evolving, but the problems are there. So we deem this is why the guidelines perhaps make sense today. But I leave to Valerio. So well. Valerio is not only an associate at Freshfields, he was part of the uh, the team or the people within Freshfields that actually commented on the guidelines. So I, I would like to start by asking Valerio, like, uh, you know, feel free to start it off as you want, but what interests me most is uh, what do you, what does Freshfield think of the guidelines? How do you think they're they're helpful and how would you want them, uh, if at all, be shaped differently in order for uh, you to use them in the future? So uh, first of all, thank you for hosting us and for being here. Of course. Uh, hello, everyone. And congratulations for making it to the last day of Paris Arbitration Week. I I'm happy to give a contribution to the conversation and, of course, uh, opening to the whole audience. Uh, with some maybe general comments on the guidelines. And I think a good starting point for that is to recognize that there is a perception in the arbitration community that we do need some form of guidance on this. Um, I'm happy to be proved wrong in this room, but for what I heard from uh, colleagues in our internal consultation on these guidelines. Uh, you also see a couple of uh, surveys on this. There is a need for some guidance on this issue. And so the guidelines, these guidelines, I think are a welcome uh, initiative in that they do address a real uh, request from the community. That's uh, the first thing I, I would say. I think it's also an ambitious initiative because it does face a number of challenges, and I would uh, probably mention three. I think the first challenge is that uh, lawyers are not natural innovators. I also think we can agree on that. Uh, and so the challenge that these guidelines face is to force a category that by and large is more used to conservation than innovation to deal with a very transformative technology. Um, that's a good challenge. I think there is another challenge um, uh, that was mentioned already. The subject matter, AI, is very dynamic, is very um, fast evolving. But of course, the ambition for the guidelines is to be here to stay. Um, and so, it is. It needs to be. The guidelines need to be able to accommodate new developments um, that are not even foreseeable right now. I think you see that in the, um, the definition of AI that you use, which is intentionally a very broad one because we, you want to have room to accommodate what will come, and we don't really know now. We can even foresee now what will come. Um, I think then there is a, a third challenge um, that is the tension I think we see between on the one hand, I need to have, um, or rather, there is a range of rules and regulation in this field. And so we want to try to avoid the fragmentation and create some, some form of level playing field. That's on the one hand, but on the other, you have to be conscious of the limitations that are inherent in an instrument like this. And I think there you see the non-derogation clause in the guidelines. They have to acknowledge that there are some mandatory rules that will still apply and the guidelines cannot trump those rules. Uh, but I think then the bottom line is that we do need some form of international standards. So I think the commentary says common denominator baseline for especially for international proceedings. Um, and so that leads me to um, really a, a general observation on the approach as I of the guidelines, as I understand it. I think it is the right one in the sense that the approach is to guide, not to dictate. Again, I think I'm quoting the, the commentary. Um, and, and that to me means that the guidelines do not pretend to have the answers. They, in other words, they don't encapsulate the best practices in this area, 
what they want to do is to create a framework so that so that we can develop these best practices. I think this um, this approach is a sensible one in this case. And uh, and so again, I think this is a very uh, welcome and, and ambitious initiative. Thank you, Th thank you, Valerio. I um. So before we started in the room, we actually had our friends on Zoom answer a brief poll. I'm not sure if we can pull up that poll to see um what the outcome was. Ah, there we go. So we asked to choose the most important AI-related concern from the followers. And it looks like bias was of 32%. Reliability, explainability, malicious use of technology, apparently no disruption to business, which is a good thing. It means, you know, we all agree that AI is here to stay and, and we'll use it one way or another. Ethical concerns and data privacy. That's uh, that's impressive. Okay, um, are are there any views in the room? A anything different to what the poll says? Do you mind if I start with the gentleman over here? What? My name is Gerhard Wagner. I teach arbitration in uh, Humboldt University at Berlin, and I was noticing that there were two guidelines which were saying something which was not obvious. One was dealing with disclosure obligations of counsel who used AI. There were two versions. One was beginning by saying, under the following conditions, you have to disclose. The other said, in general, you don't have to disclose, but for certain instances. And then the second guideline, which dealt with uh, the, um, the prohibition for arbitrators to delegate their function. And I think there must have been discussions on those two provisions, um, and they relate to the risks that the group that drafted the principles um, perceived. Otherwise, I mean, if there were no risks, um, then why disclose that you used it? You wouldn't disclose the maker of your computer or your typewriter in older days. Uh, so why or the books that you that you used in compiling your submission? Why would you be under an obligation to disclose the use of AI tools? If you cite cases that don't exist because you make them up in your mind, that's bad. If you do it with the help of an AI tool, that's equally bad. But the duty to disclose that you didn't read the cases that, that sounds strange to me. So. What were your considerations, I asked the people who drafted, uh, when, and what were your discussions, in essence, uh, when you thought about this duty to, duty to disclose? And as to the second principle, delegation of arbitrator powers, I think it's understood that it would not be okay for an arbitrator to just hit a button and then have a, 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 a um, software produce decision and then send it off to the parties, that's clear. But anything below that threshold is less clear to me. If, if certain parts of the award, let's say the, uh, the account of the facts are compiled by artificial intelligence, is, is, that, is, is that something you shouldn't do under this guideline? Is that already a delegation of your decision-making power? We had the same discussion with a view to arbitrary secretaries. We know they can order coffee and pizza, but anything beyond you can discuss. Is it okay for them to draft parts of the award submitted to the tribunal and then they review it or don't review it and so on? So again, I don't have a solution. I just want to ask you what your considerations were when you were thinking about these two crucial points, what the risks were that you perceived when you were thinking about a duty to disclose or a prohibition to delegate powers. Thank you. Um, do you want to take the first part and I'll uh, I'll take number two? Yeah, yeah. You, I, I think uh, everyone probably you know, has has comments on this, but um, uh, I, I did want to feed in on comment on guideline three because it was in fact uh, the subject of a lot of discussion about disclosure. 
Uh, and I think at the time when we were talking about it, there was this uh, BCLP survey. Some of you may have heard of this, uh, where like the majority of people actually said we need to disclose all use of AI. That was the sort of the opinion of the community at that time. I think that's shifted tremendously between now and and last year. But actually, I think our view in the committee was we shouldn't be prescribing any any sort of disclosure obligations. But maybe what we should do is give people some factors to consider or some important considerations where uh, these types of things might uh, kind of push you towards disclosing something either affirmatively or as a member of a tribunal ordering disclosure upon request of a party, for example. And uh, there, there are certain things that I think are very much on the borderline and, and, and risky. Uh, you know, imagine if you're using a demonstrative, it has all these photographs, you're not saying that these are real photographs, but the impression is perhaps that they are real photographs, but they're completely made up. They look exactly real, but you know, it's a demonstrative. So, so maybe, um, so maybe it's not evidence as such, but nonetheless, it may influence the tribunal who may think it's real, right? Case like that, you would probably, I would say, or I, I don't want to give my personal opinion because it's the committee as a collective body that, that's putting out these the rules, but there is a case to be made that when it's a use that's a sort of a surprising or unexpected, perhaps, uh, and that may change from time to, depending on, you know, what you're exactly you're doing. Uh, if it's not obvious that it's AI generated um, and presented as such, uh, as though it were evidence, I think that's a problem. If it's being used, if people might think that it's primary evidence, uh, that is a problem, I think, uh, rather than sort of argument or secondary information. And also, I think uh, one situation, and that applies, I think, both to arbitrators using AI and counsel using AI, is... It's not black and white. It's not like everybody's either using AI or not using AI. It's it's more of a collaborative process, right? You 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 draft something. Maybe the AI helps you correct it, or or gives you some some suggestions of other arguments to make, or vice versa. You know, the AI does a first draft of something, and then you correct it and you tweak it, and you um, or maybe translates it for you, whatever. So the, there can be sort of this very very collaborative process with with AI. And the question is, you know, how do you disclose that? A lot of U.S. courts, for example, have mandated disclosure of use of AI. And what happens? Parties put at the end of a brief, you know, we used AI in in, in producing this submission, and uh, we checked everything, so it's okay. But uh, but that's it. Basically, becomes this boilerplate disclosure that I'm not sure that it adds to the conversation or it really discloses anything. But uh, but anyway, I I think it's a it's a very important topic. Um, I know that there have been some strong comments saying you should kind of completely abandon any discussion of of this when it should be disclosed and maybe just talk about when you do disclose what you should disclose or like the types of technical information that would be worth supplying to help understand. But uh, but we we wanted to be agnostic. I think we wanted to say, look, we're not going to tell you you should disclose. We're not going to tell you you shouldn't. Uh, but uh, but but here are some factors, you know, some important things that uh, should be considered, and whether it's a it's a two prong test or a, a three prong test or or a, another kind of thing, I think it really remains to be uh, to be seen. Uh, what and and we we certainly need to clarify the language. I think uh, perhaps a lot of this doesn't come across, but uh, I think there's some comment maybe from Zoom. Yes. Martha. Sorry. Um, um, yeah, I I just wanted to add um, to what Dimitri was saying. So I, I I mean, of course, we discuss this a lot, and and I agree with Dimitri that the view um, is is shifting. Probably now more and more people are saying, let's not disclose. That's it. Um, so I I think that the guidelines um, are meant to help users conduct an an issue spotting exercise and raise awareness of specific uses that might, um, might, might cause them to violate their existing duties. And here, of course, you know, there, I mean, it depends on, on, on the case, but also that imposing a general um, obligation to disclose can lead to very expensive and long procedural battles, and we don't want that. Um, so here, I, I don't know how 
this provision guideline three is going to um to 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 end up because you know we have we haven't decided yet and the review committee um is is analyzing it but i i definitely think that um the community needs to understand that there are some cases as dimitri was saying um where you may need to disclose the use of ai and also this you know it gives some um context to uh, arbitrators and and parties um to maybe raise this issue um at the beginning of the arbitration um during procedural order one and and maybe they can decide um when they think that they they need to disclose the use of of ai um so th these are all the ideas but um we have been talking about it uh, in the past month and going to um your second point uh, uh, your second question i have two points the first one is that um a judge in Colombia asks um, ChatGPT to help with uh, preparation of a judgment, and parties could do nothing. And I think this, the same happened with uh, a court in, in England. And and I believe that this could be the distinction between a courts and arbitration, where you have no option. I mean, you, I, I I'm not sure if you could appeal because the judge used AI or not, but at least in arbitration you could. Um, agree that the arbitrator or the panel will be obligated to use the brain in the hands and avoid that. Perhaps because that that would be the will of the parties. That would be a higher standard of quality. That would be the difference between justice that uh, you know judges have to decide thousands of cases, uh, and if you want to have a higher quality of standard, you would have just brains and flesh and blood humans deciding cases. So that, that would be a distinction for arbitration perhaps in the following years. It's not entirely clear. And the second point is that you want to bring um, a summary prepared by ChatGPT. You want to have a, 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 a translation prepare, prepared by Deepal. Well, I mean, that's something outside of the record. So that may be a concern because parties did not submitted that translation, parties did not submitted that um, uh, summary, and it may be uh, bogged with uh, hallucination. So at this point, I think it is a concern to have this type of thing. So this is why we wanted to bring attention at least to your second question. So, and um, <clears throat> I'll say this, I think the question is very, very good and interesting. And uh, it, it really points out how to a certain extent divided we were within the task force. I mean, in the committee, when we were debating it, at first we said, we don't need any disclosures. And if so, hey, if we at a certain point end up disclosing, because it might come up, right? Cross-examination, uh, the hearing, the arbitrator might have questions. These are the two points that we believe you really need to keep track of, right? And why we say that is because, you know, compared to other tools we use, certain, you know, the way we train AI, if we train AI, the prompts we give, they might influence the outcome. And that's why we believe that those might be might be of interest to keep track of. Again, we're not dictating anything that should happen. Um, but um, the two versions you see, it's actually quite interesting. We were very divided. We talked about it extensively. And because we couldn't agree, at a certain point, we said it should be completely up to the user to decide when, where, how. And at a, you know, another point in time, we said, you know, we have a better idea. Let's come up with a two-pronged test of when it should be disclosed. But because we weren't sure, we left it up to the public to decide. We said, you know, we don't want to make this decision for the users. Uh, two reasons. First of all, if we come up with something you don't like, you're not going to use the guidelines. Um, and second of all, in the end, what we're trying to come up with is actually something that is is, is of use to you. So, um, you know, during this whole week in, in Paris and in general, I feel that, you know, from the end of last year until this year, the question has really risen why do we even need to disclose? Um, I was talking on a panel at Queen Mary University about word writing, and um, I was asked that on three different occasions. And unfortunately, I only caught up. I understood the sense of it at the last. And that's not because I was ignorant. It was because I was so invested. All of us are so invested in writing these guidelines that for us, it's like, no, no, you know, we debated it. You know, it's done. And uh, that's why we brought on the review committee to kind of have a fresh pair of eyes look at it. Um, but the truth is that there is no right or wrong. 
right now the consensus seems to be like right now and we're, we're in March close to April uh, 2024 a consensus seems to be there doesn't need to be any disclosure it's just a tool let's not give it more volume than it actually is uh, this is not you know this is not a super brain computer that we plug into and we don't want it to make decisions for us it's rather just a tool that we can use to have it enhance our work um and you know, I think this is what the final version will go towards. Something, some guidelines saying if disclosure ever comes up in one way or another, however the parties and the arbitrators decide or request, these are the suggestions that we make. Um, but it, you know, I, I do want to make a point to 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 Orlando's uh, mention of the court cases. The difference between arbitration and court cases, and there's many. Um, you know, I, I I refuse to believe that. The cost of arbitration is the reason why people don't arbitrate. I think if people don't decide to arbitrate and go to court, it's because they have a fundamental misunderstanding of what arbitration is. Uh, Jan Paulson, who uh, I was privileged to have as my professor, said, arbitration is magic. And I really believe it. Uh, it is 100% party autonomy of how and what is being done during the hearing. That's something you will never have before a judge. Um, other than the fact that even a judge's ruling can be appealed in arbitration, except for some rules, there is no appeal mechanism. So um, it is more important for us in the arbitration community to understand and agree on a certain way of how we want to conduct the hearing. Um, you know, and then talking about AI, it's 100% up to the parties to decide what they want to do and how they want to do it. So um, getting as much feedback from the community on how they would want disclosure to be, if at all. And once it comes up, what information they want to exchange is completely up to you. Uh, we're merely trying to form some sort of framework to guide and help you um, agree. Um, and I think Sophia had a, a comment. Yes, Sophia, please. Yes, I would specifically like to address the, the second part of the question that was posed on where do we draw the line, if I understand the question correctly, is where do we draw the line between permitted and prohibited uses uh, of an AI tool by arbitrators specifically, right? And what is considered proper delegation and what is considered improper delegation? And I think that's an answer, uh, that's, a, that's really something that... Um, AI has sort of brought to the forefront, but it's it's a debate that does not just concern AI, but goes to the use of tribunal secretaries, as, as was mentioned. Um, I don't think that we, you know, we have a clear cut answer. And I think what the guidelines try to do is to provide a framework to be able to decide this on a case by case basis. So let me put just some examples. Suppose that now, you know, you can use as an arbitrator an AI tool to prepare a first draft of the procedural history of the case for an award, something that tribunal secretaries routinely do. This is sort of like an accepted form of delegation, so to speak. Um, and I don't see why the parties would object to an arbitrator using an AI tool to do that. Um, but what if we use an AI tool uh, to, for example, drop a bunch of documents into a tool and say, find me evidence of corruption in these documents. This is something that with the technology that we have available today, the technology can do this. I believe that from the perspective of the parties or council, there might be some second thoughts on whether this should be a, a totally a green lighted or permitted use of an AI tool. Why? Because ultimately, even if the arbitrator uses an AI tool to tell me, you know, detect evidence of corruption in these documents or prepare, I drop 10 documents into a tool and I ask the tool, prepare a timeline of all the documents organized by date. You still want the arbitrator to actually look at the documents. And that's the point of the guideline. It's not telling the arbitrators you can or cannot use this tool. It's whatever product goes into the award actually has to be the outcome of your analysis of your individual thought process. If you used an AI tool, that's fine, but that means that you have to actually go look at the documents and make sure that the timeline that was produced by the AI tool is accurate and it reflects your understanding and your uh, personal analysis of, of the documents. I think that's kind of the, the principle that we try to instill in the guidelines. 
uh, it's not a clear cut rule. And I think, um, uh, you know, for better or for worse, much like we do with tribunal secretaries, we will have to analyze this on a case by case basis. So at the, at the end of the guidelines, what we try to do is to provide a list of illustrative examples of when, you know, of quote, permitted and not permitted uses of AI. Um, and for the future, you know, perhaps one idea is we could expand that list to consider more scenarios where an arbitrator might be crossing the line and improperly delegating their responsibility to an AI tool um, or not. Yeah, and I, and I think that, that it will depend, even in with the procedural history, it will depend on the case because what happens if you have a defaulting party um, mm -hmm. and you, you know, you go, I mean, you arrive at the, you know, you try for Kate, the party has always been defaulting and then at the end, the party appears and decides to participate, to join the hearing and wants to reopen, you know, the issues. And this is a, a real case. This has happened, you know, so probably in, the, in in a case like that, I don't know if the arbitrator should delegate the, the the drafting of the procedural history to an AI tool, and and the same would happen probably with tribunal secretaries. You know, it will depend on the case. The idea is that the arbitrator exercises his or her judgment um, to understand when um, the circumstances the circumstances of the case allow you know to delegate a specific part of the and of its task. And if I may add, with tribunal secretaries, the, the the tribunal at the beginning of the case will disclose that they intend to um, have an assistant or a secretary to the tribunal. And usually uh, they will also file uh, a statement saying that there's no conflict of independence and impartiality and the parties will agree uh, to, to the involvement of that person as an assistant in the arbitration. So there is a, already a process of disclosure uh, built in to the use of tribunal secretaries. And that's why, um, you know, the question that we pose to the arbitration community is whether that same duty of disclosures should exist when an arbitrator is using an AI tool uh, to carry out tasks that today are uh, performed by uh, tribunal secretaries. So the reason, uh, just a brief, you know, to, to, to make a differentiation, the reason we did not go into too much details on the arbitrator and why the arbitrator shouldn't disclose, hey, I'm using AI for X, Y, Z, are you guys okay with it? The same we do with the tribunal secretary uh, is twofold. First of all, um, we're not there yet. Uh, arbitrators are not on, on constant basis using an AI tool for a certain um, task, just because as of now, we don't even know what exact task AI can do. Uh, and second of all, it took nearly a hundred years for arbitrators to start disclosing the use of tribunal secretaries. We've started doing this maybe five, 10 years ago, uh, but we've used tribunal secretaries in one form or another since at least the inception of the ICC. I see Marek Rasula. Thank you so much for coming. Um, so, um, you know, the it, it took time for the community, for the people to understand, okay, this is what a tribunal secretary does. This is why we need disclosure. And I don't think we, especially giving just some soft law guidelines, would be at the place to say, no, no, this is what needs to be done. So we will have to you know, see the involvement of the use and then take it from there. I will briefly just ask Sophia, because she did draw my attention to the fact that there's some good uh, questions in the chat. Um, if you want to just uh, pick one or two of those. Can I just make one, one point before we do that? Uh, there is an Annex A to the guidelines, and Annex A to the guidelines contains a list of uh, what we sort of labeled as compliant and non-compliant uses of AI, illustrating each one of the guidelines. So guideline one, here's what we think complies, here's what we think doesn't comply. And that was specifically to spark some discussion and to spark some some thinking about this, because we we all know the, the IBA um, you know, guidelines and conflict of interest, the red, orange, green lists, and uh, I think those have been tremendously useful precisely because they're sort of illustrative examples or categories of sort of things that should or should not be necessarily disclosed. And so we wanted, we we toyed around with that idea uh, specifically when we were drafting, but in the end, we decided to put out this kind of Annex A, um, which had a little bit more sort of black and white examples, maybe a little bit simplistic, but uh, nonetheless, some people have commented that they felt that that was the most useful part of the guidelines because it was very sort of hands-on and practical, uh, even if a little abstract. So I just wanted to, because it hasn't been mentioned yet today, I did I did want to draw attention to it. 
thank you. Uh, Sophia, do you want to take a crack at the questions? Taking a crack at the question is a very American uh, form of saying. <laughs> yeah. Implying sure. Connotation. Sorry about that. So we have a question in the chat. Um, what are the consequences of not complying with these guidelines? And I think that's uh, you know a very uh, a very uh, good question uh, because the guidelines purposely uh, remain silent on the consequences of non-compliance. Uh, why? The main reason is that um, the guidelines basically what they do is that they um, um, contain a remboa to existing rules of ethical conduct, uh, of professional responsibility, um, or, uh, rules uh, that have to do with how you conduct a procedure that already exist in arbitration rules and other soft law instruments. And so um, we didn't want to reinvent the wheel, right? So I'm going to put a specific example. Let's say with respect to guideline five, which has to do with manipulation of evidence using AI. Let's say that a party in an arbitration, uh, you know, manipulates or present, presents a deep fake video, right? A manipulated evidence uh, in the proceedings. The consequence for that will most likely already be provided for in the arbitration rules, or maybe the parties agreed to use the IBA rules on the taking of evidence. Um, and, you know, by and large, it's something that, um, that ultimately will be decided by the tribunal. So we did not want to be prescriptive in that sense. In practice, these issues are resolved by arbitral tribunals, sometimes by, um, um, shifting the costs to one party, right, to the party that used manipulated evidence as a form of a, a, um, a sanction, so to speak. Uh, more likely than not, the tribunal will decide that that evidence is inadmissible. So the, the arbitration system, let's put it that way, already has ways of dealing with uh, the types of inconduct or misconduct that are covered by the guidelines. However, I mean, and this is a question that we have posed to the arbitration community and that has come up in the comments is that some users have uh, pointed out that they would like to see specific consequences for the, the violation of specific guidelines. And so that's something that the review committee will take up uh, during um, the, their work in the next uh, month or so. And you know, we will see if, if we add specific consequences to the guidelines or not. But, that, that was the reasoning uh, of the, the drafting committee is that you know, there are already consequences provided uh, in the arbitration rules and in the rules of ethical and professional responsibility. And so we did not want to overstep. Thank you, Sophia. Um, so before addressing another question here in, in, in our audience, I did briefly just want to ask Valerio. Uh, Valerio, if uh, let's say you're in an arbitration, which, you are in often, um, hopefully more often than, than not. Um, let's say you, you know, righteously so decide to use the SVMC AI guidelines in the procedural order number one, and you see that your opposing party is using, uh, let, let's not exaggerate with saying deep fakes, but you know, you, you analyze some of their submissions and you see that AI was used to an extent where, um, you know, the, the documents and, and the facts don't really support that. Um, is there anything concrete you would do? Uh, what would your, your approach be? It's at the forefront. Um, it is definitely something to take very seriously. Um, and I think guidelines, the guidelines can help in creating awareness in the community so that even tribunals will react in a certain way to allegation from one side against the other that something like this happened. Um, uh, okay, uh, one, two, yes. So I, I don't want to put you on the spot. I was just curious, you know, like, um, is this something you would address with opposing party directly? Is this something where you believe, you know, it would be warranted to to address the tribunal to take any, con you know, inverse adverence or um, 
Yeah, I, I think that dep that good. depends on on the circumstances, but generally, and in here talking uh, from really my personal perspective, yeah. I think it's. Uh, I, I like when parties try to fix any sorts of problem by uh, among themselves, between themselves, and engage the tribunal only if necessary. So I think I would apply that approach to this kind of issue as well. Then it depends on the circumstances, depends on the seriousness of uh, the issue that is at stake. The reason we called out counsel specifically in in these guidelines, or I think one of the reasons, and and is is that it, not always are the deep fakes or or fake things going to be known necessarily to counsel or known necessarily to sort of the repeat players in arbitration who we expect to be acting ethically and with their professional duties, but it, it might be a witness uh, who doesn't know you know what an arbitration procedure is like. And they might say, well, I'm too lazy to draft my witness statement. I'm just going to, you know, use AI to, to do a first draft of my witness statement or, or something. And, and it just, uh, because the technology is now so good that it's hard to distinguish real from fake, that it's, uh, you know, think an, an, an obligation that's incumbent on counsel and arbitrators to be particularly mindful, even if they're not the ones aware of this but just to be mindful that this 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 can be there and that you should be watching out for it uh like a hawk uh regardless of what what role you're playing in the case thank you yeah. um, sorry then and i and as Dimitri was saying it can also be local council for example <clears throat> who might not be, may not be so familiar with international arbitration in some cases or experts too. So that I think that the idea is that council is aware, uh, council are aware of, of, of these issues and you know sort of act as gatekeepers. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Valerio, Dimitri, and, and, and Marta. Very insightful. Um, we have one more question from the audience. Uh, of course, if there's more, please uh, raise your hand. We want it to be as interactive as possible. Thank you. Uh, so it's uh, Christophe de Gay again. Uh, in fact, you you did ask a question to the audience, which was our reaction to the outcome, the result of the poll. Uh, and, and then we went into these interesting discussions, which in a way answer uh, your first question, because what we agree is that arbitration is a matter of trust, a matter of trust in, in, in the tribunal, uh, and uh, in particular, and trust in counsel and trust in witnesses. and. Uh, what we are facing, and you're correct to say that it's difficult to impose anything today because first, uh, the technology will change, so we do not know exactly what it can do and how it will be used uh, first. Uh, and then we already have rules in place that, in fact, call the situation whatever technology is used, uh, as was uh, rightly uh, uh, said already. But uh, my recollection of the uh, outcome of the poll is that the parties because you can answer uh, this in at a different level, whether as a user or uh, at the level of the planet, what you know, or for other considerations that have to do with the ethical issues or uh, implementation of the uh, IAA Act and, and the like. So, uh, and people used to answer to questions which are more close to them as users. And what I see, which is very positive, that I assume the people answering the poll are more like uh, tech savvy. So the answer is that for people who know how it works and what it what it does and what it doesn't do uh, and cannot do, uh, they are uh, insisting on the fact that it's not reliable. The, the issue is reliability and trust. Uh, and so I think it's very important once people, and that, that's part of my the, the first point we discussed uh, earlier, is that when people are uh, knowledgeable enough about this technology and keep current uh, to the state of the technology, they know how to adjust uh, in the arbitration. And so that's, to me, is a reason why it's wise first to have the rules uh, the whole, and especially to uh, draw the attention of uh, what you kept optional uh, information of use of AI in international arbitration. I think very important, and especially as arbitrator now, uh, our, uh, my intention is to ask uh, whether or not the parties used uh, AI and for what purpose. 
especially in the context of uh, uh, witness hearings, and especially for um, not the, the layman as, as a witness, but for, for uh, technical experts. Because, you know, it's very important. What do you ask to, to experts? You know, are, are you the one who drafted the report? Yeah, uh, you signed it, but did you draft it? Yeah. And then you can ask questions, otherwise it's not worth it. So if the guy used AI to draft it, fine but I need to understand what he did. And I think that that's part of when the technology is more mature and when you, you will have a number of them using their own technology, I, I'm certain that we'll have debates on the use of technology to make sure that, you know, equality for all farms, the kind of uh, technology used, how was it um, trained on what, on what basis and, and, and that, on what data and so forth. So I, I have, uh, continuing debates on the use of AI but at a higher level in the coming years. Thank you very much. No, that uh, makes a lot of sense. Um, we had one more question here in the front. Hey, yeah, thank you very much for, for the presentation. Uh, I had uh, one question. Like you mentioned like during the debate, like uh, examples like of prohibited use of artificial intelligence. And as well, I think it was you that mentioned the the risk of fragmentation. And to be honest, I, I don't know if I I I I think the the risk really exists because, for instance, what is a prohibited use of artificial intelligence in Europe might be not the same uh, prohibited use of artificial intelligence in the United States or in China or 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 wherever. So. How can we like uh, avoid this fragmentation? Uh, take it into account the fact that the state law are not harmonized under at the, at the international level. There is not an international convention or on artificial intelligence. So at the end, there's there will be a like a, a fragmentation between like different. Uh, different arbitration uh, uh, communities because, because of, of the difference that exists uh, within nation states uh, of what is prohibited and what is not prohibited. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, I, I'll let Orlando start. Two comments very briefly. So, um, one of the differences of technology is that uh, the ubiquity. I mean, you can use ChatGPT here in Chile and you just need access to the internet. So that's one, um, the capacity to escalate and the accessibility to large uh, portions of the population. That's one of the trigger and benefits of, 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 of the technology. And, and this is part of the business and how they frame the business. And this is, for instance, with Juice Mundi. I mean, I can have access to Juice Mundi in Mexico, in, in, in Paris and in Hong Kong, and, and we have access. And when um, there is an interview where um, Bill Gates asks to Sam Altam how he ambitions the future regulation of AI, and Sam Altam answers that he believes that an international treaty, an international code will be, and, and it makes perfect sense because this is the only way that a tool that it's available throughout the world will have the same uh, level of um, of uh, regulation, and and this is how I believe uh, uh, in harmony with the business they have to conquer the world and to make available the the the, the, the technology, the tool, the algorithm to the entire population. So I believe uh, it makes sense, uh, and and also because uh, ICC they have one single set of rules that apply to arbitrations in Saudi Arabia, in New York, and in Chile. So how is that um, a procedure could have the same set of rules? Well, I believe it's the same with the technology that it's available throughout the world. And um, I, I, I will piggyback on that. Um, and I think it, it, it's a very valid point. Um, unfortunately, uh, we will never have the same standard worldwide. So even nowadays, when it comes to enforcement of arbitral awards, there's a very different standard, and the, you know the people are very divisive on the, what is a local standard of enforcement versus an international standard of enforcement. And uh, Canon 
an annulled award at the seat be enforced uh, in another place? What is actually, you know, um, what were the reasons of an annulment at the seat? Is that enough to consider it public policy? Well, is the public policy at the seat uh, enough to warrant the annulment of the ward and enforcement in another seat uh, at another place around the world? I just, I, as of now, I don't think uh, we can predict what AI will do. I'll throw out an idea though, because um, the EU just came out with the EU AI Act. Uh, we haven't seen it published yet. It'll be published soon. Uh, and it'll come into force, it's my understanding, two years after the publication. Um, the, you know, I personally, I see uh, some red flags. I, I might be exaggerating here, um, but the one of the issues I see is that it requires the providers to get certified. Now, anybody who's familiar with certification in Europe knows that it's not a, a, a two minute story. And uh, anybody who's familiar with tech knows that tech is very fast paced. So when we're talking about certifying providers, does that mean providers need to get certified and everything they bring out is good? Does every version need to be certified? How long will it take? How costly will it be? Because some tech companies just don't have the budget. And uh, I'm, I'm just gonna you know, uh, throw this idea out there. I don't have a strong view yet because it's just so fresh, but um, you know, let's say we are in 2026 and this is being enforced and it does take time to, uh, to certify. Doesn't that encourage, doesn't it potentially encourage especially arbitration practitioners to move the seats outside of the EU where uh, it is not restricted on the use of AI? And I'm not saying let's have AI decide. I'm saying AI is a powerful tool that can save clients a lot of money. Um, and uh, yeah, and then we'll have to see again as a response to that whether the EU at a certain point may potentially come out with uh, with ideas similar to GDPR, where it says any European party has a right to GDPR, and maybe they will say any European party will have the right to the EU AI Act, and uh, whether that might not encourage us to look at other um, conventions outside the New York Convention. So um, just some some food for thought. I heard these during the week. I thought it was very uh, Interesting, but uh, yeah, thank you know, thanks for for starting the conversation on that because I do think that there is a huge discrepancy in general, uh, you know, when it comes to legal principles, and I think uh, here AI is is more than a legal principle, but uh, the legal framework is very different, and the approach seems to be extremely different in Europe versus uh, uh, the U.S., for example, or the rest of the world. Um, and so as of now, it's my understanding that it doesn't apply to okay. users. It doesn't. And that's another concern that, you know, personally, you know, my thought is if somebody uses a Microsoft computer to hack the World Bank, would Microsoft be, you know, on the hook? Like, I don't think that putting all the pressure on the providers to get certified is right. And what does certification mean? Does it need to be recertified after time? It's, it's complicated, uh, especially because, uh, and, and correct me, I might not have the numbers right, but the commission is looking to allocate around 60 million euros into creating an agency to overlook the EU AI Act. And uh, with all due respect and without getting into public policy, I think this money is very well off being spent on something else. Um, I just wanted to take a moment to ask uh, my colleagues, Sophia and Marta, if, uh, if you guys have any more questions or um, comments. And uh, then, you know, I would ask the audience if there's any follow-ups. No, I will just maybe add very briefly on this last point of fragmentation, um, which is very valid, is that uh, the approach taken by the guidelines is that the guidelines do not derogate from any mandatory rules that are applicable, uh, for example, in the seat or of arbitration, right? So um, any mandatory rules or regulations that apply uh, in the seat of arbitration take precedence. And in that case, uh, you know, the rules, uh, the, the guidelines would not apply. Um, and and th this is a problem that we will always have, uh, this sort of conflict of laws. Um, it is, after all, a soft law instrument. Uh, and so the parties will, uh, in a way, have to observe uh, any rules or regulation in the place of arbitration. Um, however, what we wanted to do with the guidelines is so to speak, to create a minimum common denominator, right? A sort of like baseline rules that everyone could agree to internationally um, uh, as the starting point, as a starting point. Uh, but obviously the guidelines are soft law and they cannot derogate from any mandatory rules. This is actually stated in the preliminary provisions that we didn't have a, a chance to go through 
uh, today, but um, you, if you want, you can take a look at uh, the text of those preliminary pr provisions and how this issue of non-derogation is explained. Um, hi, thank you very much for the fascinating discussion. Uh, Thomas Lehman from Clear Gottlieb and Queen Mary uh, University PhD candidate. Um, have a, I'm trying to think of the consequences of using AI. For parties, the consequence if you're using deep fake is obviously very serious and should be sanctioned. If you're using AI to draft, then maybe the arbitral tribunal will find it very weak and sanction you for that in, in the award. But if an arbitral tribunal, if the arbitrators use AI and disclose it, then I wonder whether the award is fully reasoned. Whereas in the US and US courts, we crest international commercial awards to be fully reasoned. And you have said prior now that when AI applies to facts or to any arguments, it does not reason. It just uses predict predictable uh, numbers to find and to state out the text. So in that sense, I'm wondering whether this guideline or maybe arbitrator disclosing that they're using AI will not open up for a floodgate of um, annulment proceedings against awards that have been rendered using AI and disclosing that. So no, thank you for the question. I'll I'll, I'll have, yeah, it's working. Um, I'll have some of my uh, co-panelists and colleague answer as well. I did just want to you know say say a few things to that. Um, you know, all valid points, but again, it, it burns down to how much are we giving AI its own brain, right? So frankly, as of now, and that's, you know, I have a big issue with arbitra with, with tribunal secretaries being fried for putting into inform too much information. This is something that really comes down to the arbitrator. I'm, you know, I'm a full-time arbitrator and it comes down to me to decide what I put in my awards. Um, if I have, you know, if I go out of my way, I as the tribunal secretary, hey, why did you think about this? Do you think we should do X, Y, Z? Now, you know, that's an ethical issue that, you know, I need to deal with and I need to deal with the consequences of that. Um, but as of now, and this is what we've tried to do is we're, we're trying to create a, you know, a framework that basically indicates that AI is a, a supplement to your work. There is, for example, it can help arbitrators extremely well in summarizing procedural history. Uh, in other words, why pay a tribunal secretary? And I'm really sorry, I'm a tribunal secretary as well. It's really not, you know, it's a little to our detriment, but why pay a tribunal secretary or even arbitrator that don't have a tribunal secretary? Why pay so much money to have somebody, you know, formulate the procedural history if you can have AI do it? And when I say this, I don't say put it in AI, put it, you know, copy paste, that's it. No, you have an obligation to make sure it's, it, it's accurate. You know, uh, uh, Marek, who sits uh, close to you, can, can confirm. You know the rigorous, uh, the rigorous um, scrutiny uh, that, that awards go through when you submit anything to the ICC. So, you know, if if an arbitrator feels comfortable copying pasting AI, then that arbitrator will really have to, you know, uh, live with the consequences of it. But I think where we're at is. Um, First of all, we believe that arbitrators, the same way parties appoint an arbitrator believing that they're competent to decide on their case, the same way we believe the arbitrator is well aware of the fact of what they should be doing and what they should not be doing. And that they're very conscious of what it is that can be done, should be done, or should be avoided, right? If arbitrators decide to copy paste, even when disclosing, you know, if, 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 if they're so comfortable as to be challenged and potentially have their career take a completely different path by trying out how AI may, may help them in their awards, you know, that then so be it. Um, our take and, and my personal take is that I don't believe that anybody would ever do it. Uh, AI is a powerful tool, but it is a tool that needs to be directed by us. And uh, if it's used properly, then personally, I don't see any issues with it. Um, it also goes back a little bit on the question of, you know, why don't we define what is uh, uh, decision making, like what is the decision making process? It's not for us to decide. It's not for the parties to decide. It's quite frankly for the arbitrator sitting, presiding, to decide what they believe, if it's more than one, um, is accurate um, and, and what is right to be put in the award. So, um, you know, uh, 
anyone can use AI, use the tribunal secretary, use Google to copy paste and put very irrelevant information or even relevant information that doesn't reflect the accurate case in their uh, award, but it does burn down to, are you ready to take a fall for it? In the Avianca case, um, the attorney got chastised in open court. It's available online. It's, it's a very fascinating, it's like a you know, thriller story going back and forth where the attorneys have been basically cross-examined by, by, by the judge. Um, now they have been fined five thousand dollars, which is nothing compared to the public humility. And it's also my understanding that as of yesterday or two days ago, uh, they didn't even have to pay that fine. Uh, but again, I don't think that it can be valued monetarily. The amount of disgrace that you go through, uh, should you try to uh, not abide by ethical standards. Does anyone else on the panel have a comment on this? Yeah, can I can I react yeah. to that? Um, so. I I think it's wrong to equate use of AI with lack of reasoning. Um, so if we're talking about annulment of awards, the question is, does the award have a reasoning or not? And then it's on its face. It doesn't matter if um, there is some use of AI involved or not. Um, the award has a reasoning, yes, no. You have also you know, fully human awards that arguably are not sufficiently reasoned. So. I don't see an issue with AI in, in this sense. AI cannot AI can take us to A to B and cannot explain why, which is why I think right now is a pretty weak tool when it comes to advocacy, because it cannot really make an argument and explain why that argument uh, should stand. But for our words, I am a bit more optimistic. I mean, just as some an arbitrator wouldn't say uh, in drafting the award. Oh, I, I went to Google and I I googled this and this is what I got and this is what I'm therefore putting in my award. For the same reason, you wouldn't go and say, you know, oh, I I asked ChatGPT this question and uh, this is what it answered and therefore I'm this is the basis on which I'm issuing the decision. Right. First of all, if somebody did that, they probably wouldn't disclose it. And second of all, of course, obviously you shouldn't do it. You shouldn't be using AI general purpose like chat GPT or, or something similar as a source of knowledge, right? It shouldn't be your your source of information, it shouldn't be something that you're relying on. Uh, I think that's fairly, um, at least at this stage of AI, is is, is it probably a good rule of thumb. So, uh, okay, here. Uh, yes. Go ahead, Alexander. Yep, working. Perfect. Hi. Alexander Wagenheim from, from Yusmundi. A couple of quick comments and one, one, one question. Uh, first of all, I don't think anybody said this, but thank you so much for doing that, guys. Um, it's, it's an incredible job, and the fact that the entire community is involved in answering, uh, we, we, we also answer to the, uh, to the guidelines and, um, and to the commentary. Uh, I, I was personally uh, relieved to, under to see that the community was going more towards uh, not going on, on full obligation of disclosure. This is something that we, 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 we uh, also advocated, uh, not, not to go that route. Um, you, you mentioned, uh, Benjamin, about the EU, um, EU Act. It was uh, voted at Parliament last week. And, and, and so we, we are also, as, as a deployer, uh, very concerned about the effect of that act on whatever product we might put up for the arbitration community in that respect. Um, the considered high risk are administration of justice. And since last week, they also added alternative dispute resolution in the clause, um, which obviously triggered many discussion. Um, there is, however, one interesting point for our discussion about what's the threshold. And they've actually put some guidelines as to what cannot be considered a high risk in the administration of justice being interpreting, uh, applying a law to facts and what tools can help doing that. And they, they've put three criteria, which are, I think, interesting and might be worth looking at, which are when you're using it for a narrow procedural task, when you're using it to enhance an already taken decision by a human, and they gave a general decision saying, uh, whenever it's not used to replace or influence a human decision. So there are some interesting wording uh, that, that might be interesting. So maybe one question uh, for you in how you conceived and how you, you arrived at that result 
have you have you looked at the various legislation around that to sort of even though they're not applicable to registration per se, but for example, the EU Act is is is, is a good threshold to 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 have in mind when doing the second version. And the other uh, question, which is which is also related, it's to towards the next steps of the process. You have an amazing review uh, committee, and you and you and you want to 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 put out the draft uh, first and soon. And it's a, a great idea because we already know that there are some other projects and. Uh, it would be better for all of us to agree on one set of rules that would be applicable. Um, but do you are you sending a new version to the review committee? Do you have already a new draft uh, following the the comments that you received, or are you waiting for all the consultation institution review committee to put up the final draft uh, out? Thank you. It, 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 thank you. I, just to answer the last question first, uh, the review committee has the original draft to work with that everyone here has. Has access to and they have access to the comments. We also, by the way, hope to publish the comments in some form and in a, in a public document that that everyone can actually see uh, see what uh, what comments we've received. Uh, I think, although we haven't probably followed every piece of legislation in every country, uh, certainly the EU AI Act is is a big one, and I, I actually. Hadn't heard about the amendment last week to include alternative dispute resolution, but I always thought, does the administration of justice, does that high risk category include arbitration or not include arbitration? So it's it's interesting. Uh, to, it'll be interesting to see the development of it and uh, what that means. Uh, you know, certainly within the EU, for any provider who deals with, you know, as you know, we are in a similar position of of looking to to develop AI tools and. Uh, Figuring out, you know, are we going to be liable uh, depending on on what kind of tool we we put out? So, um, so it's you know, it's a big. Uh, I'm speaking now not on behalf of Silicon Valley, but on behalf of a company that um, I found it. But uh, it uh, it is a, it is an important issue. Uh, we have looked, I think, at some guidance that the U.S. courts have given. Um, the U.K. courts have given some similar guidance, um, mostly in the area of disclosure. Uh, but but it, it wasn't necessarily something that we we were ready to follow. I think as we discussed. Yeah. So um, to answer your first question, because um, it hits home, uh, yeah, I'm I'm originally German, so uh, you know it's uh, moving away from the EU is is uh, is hard in many ways always. Um, but you know I, I'll say this. You know you, you said they they added ADR and uh, but it's permitted in narrow research. You know, I, I have huge problems with that formulation as of now. I think this will change and become more concrete. But, you know, I'll ask you, you know, just Mundi is an amazing and powerful tool. Um, but you are still a tech startup. Um, you know, if you need to be certified, how can you guarantee that somebody uses it for a narrow task and not for an overall task, you know, quoting tons of things everywhere? And plus, I don't know if legally, we can even define, and when I say legally, is if, if you know, a European court has decided what is a narrow task with an ADR, right? So I think that it's going to be very interesting to see how the procedure goes. It's going to be interesting to see how and, and if they will restrict access, you know, to a certain extent to use the full Just Mundi database within Europe uh, so that it can only be used narrowly. Um, or whether you know they will transfer some of the responsibilities, which as of now it just doesn't look to be that way. Um, but you know, I think we can just wait and see. Um, it would be very unfortunate to have legal tech companies either move away from the EU or be restricted in the EU, within the EU, um, because of course you know ha having restricted access to just Mundi also means that people within the EU wouldn't pay the full amount. So you know, tech companies are or are are in need of the subscriptions, are in need of uh, of all the support. So um, I will just say this for, for anyone who hasn't used Just Mundi, an extremely powerful tool. Please try it out. They just launched their AI assistant, which is uh, is extremely good as, as, as far as I understand. So, uh, you know, take advantage of it as, 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 as much as you can. I'm sure that you will stay up to date and it will always, you know, be well. But uh, it's, it's a very good question. And I just don't think that neither we nor, I don't even think the European Commission has any, you know, has any answer as to what will happen? I think we'll have to sit tight and wait and see what happens. But um, it, in the end, it does boil down to the community to speak up, to ask our representatives to do something, to try to make them understand that tech is a fast-paced uh, sport. And uh, if the EU is really so adamant on putting so much responsibility on providers, then providers will move away. 
and um, it's it, it would be uh, you know it, it wouldn't be the best thing. So um, if there aren't any further, there's one more question. Okay, excellent. Please, thank you. Try the other microphone. Well, I just I just tried. Ah, there Sorry. we go. Uh, I have two questions actually. I will try to be very short. Uh, one uh, on witness statements. I haven't read the guidelines, to be honest, but I want to know if you have thought of the situation that we briefly discussed today on witness statements, that the requirement today is that they should be uh, the recollection, 100% recollection of the witness. Um, yesterday, I participated in a, in a seminar at King and Spalding, and there was a panel of uh, arbitrators in their, in their 60s, and a person in the public asked, well, I know there is software that you can feed it with all the emails and letters uh, sent or received by that person and all the contracts signed by that person and maybe other witness statements mentioned in that person and can create the first draft of a witness statement. Um, personally, I don't have a view as long as the witness reviews and signs and corrects. Uh, but this, this panel of arbitrators yesterday, they said, we're not against, um, but we would like to uh, be informed that the first draft was uh, generated by artificial intelligence. So first question would be your views or if you have discussed or if the guidelines contains anything in connection with this point. Second is uh, whether in your experience you've seen that uh, solo practitioners and smaller boutiques are pushing more for the use of artificial intelligence in international arbitration, while big law firms with more resources and, and lawyers, maybe they're more skeptical or they want to, to go slower. If that clash exists or or both solo practitioners and, and big law firms are moving forward with artificial intelligence in arbitration. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, I'll start with the first question. Um, and it, you, you know, the same way different arbitrators have different approaches uh, when, when it comes to, to their proceedings. I think here it would fall down, down to who do you have in front of you. Um, as of now, I think it's safe to say that no witness has ever written his or her own statement in the form that it is submitted to the tribunal. Um, they may have written a, a draft of it. They may have seen a draft of it. Um, they, you know, they, they, they timestamp it, they sign it, and they submit it. And I think tribute, you know, uh, arbitrators are very well aware of it. Um, you know, I, I would come back to, you know, I, I would take the stance again, you know, from the from the drafting committee and say, you know, we're merely giving guidance. And I think um, it, it's important, you know, for for counsel and the witness to decide what route to go. Do would you want to input some information that happened and have AI draft the whole? Uh, statement as if as if AI was the person, or you know, uh, put it in the mouth of the 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 witness. Or, you know, uh, I don't know these dates. This happened. These dates. This happened, and AI comes up with a full report. Or are you using AI just to help you on grammatical issues and to kind of uh, you know fill the lack or, or say you know here's something is missing here, something is missing here. It's um, you know, it comes down to what we what we talked to a little earlier, which is. Are you using it to supplement your work or are you using it to replace some of your work? Um, so I, you know, I don't have a strong view on it. I think in the end, anyone, any arbitrator, any counsel, any counterparty um, would find out one way or another, um, whether it was drafted by AI or by, you know, the, the, the witness. Um, I do believe in party autonomy. I think that it's very important for the parties to, to be in charge and to lead the way. So if the parties believe that that is the right way to go, then by all means, you know, things always come out um, and it's for the arbitrator to ask the right questions. Um, you know, we, we haven't taken a strong view of what you should disclose, merely guidance on when we believe disclosure is appropriate. Uh, and I'll briefly talk on uh, the second question. Um, I'll actually let uh, Dimitri answer the first one as well. He's an independent arbitrator. I'm not going to comment. Uh, I actually just wanted to comment as a disclaimer to say that anything we say here on this panel, we're saying in our personal capacities 
uh, should not be commented as con constitute an official comment to the guidelines if and when they're published. Uh, and um, uh, just to put that out there, um, we the guidelines uh, speak for themselves. Uh, and uh, to the extent there's official commentary, that will be part of it. But uh, that's all I wanted to say. Yeah, so um, I, I'll pass the word on to, to uh, Orlando. I did just want to say, you know, to your second point, and I'll be very brief. Um, I feel that um, bigger firms are more prone to use AI, or from what I hear, their voice is louder in wanting to use AI because it saves time and costs for the client. Um, and I believe that the use of AI may actually help smaller firms to potentially compensate uh, the lack of, uh, of people power uh, behind the drafting, right? Um, but again, uh, my personal view, it's, you know, it boils down to what you do with AI. Are you using it as a research tool? Are you using it as a tool to complement your work, supplement your work, or replace your work? And that is an ethical question that, you know, I believe every practitioner and, and, and arbitrator will have to ask themselves and decide uh, amongst that. Um, very briefly, three points. Um, I reiterate, technology uh, escalates. It's widely available. And Alexander here can confirm, and I'm sure that uh, Juice Mundi has um, subscriptions for solo practitioners. So before having a huge library with thousands of books was only restricted to a law firm like like this one. Solo practitioner could not afford to have hundreds of books. So this is a difference, so I think it helps. But somehow, um, big law firms can also uh, use their leverage. Uh, for instance, having an ovary, now it's um, having Harvey. And, and uh, they say that they have uh, put all the information of all the transactions and bills to Harvey. And when a client asks to have the perfect clause, then Harvey allows them to tailor the perfect clause based on the uh, hundreds of hours of experience they have uh, with other matters. So this is how they are trying to leverage. And, and, and a final point, uh, if you have used relativity, it's expensive. So I would say that only big matters and big clients having very big necessities can afford the luxury of having relativity. So I think it's, it's, it, it depends on the size of the client, the size of the matter. So, but, 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 it, but there is a mix, but I would say that as technology escalates, even solo practitioners, solo um, arbitration secretaries can benefit from that. And I believe uh, we, we we can conclude now, right? Yes, I, I would kindly, yeah, I would kindly ask uh, if, if Martha and Sophia would like to comment uh, or add anything to, to this valuable conclusion. It is a, a one of a kind, you know, in-person and virtual presentation uh, of the drafting committee. Uh, and, and, you know, be, be, before um, both of you say a few last words, I do want to say that I, I, I'm extremely grateful to have been able to, to chair this, this drafting committee with, uh, you know, seven extremely bright people that were able to come up with these guidelines that we have before us now. So, um, you know, I, I really wanted to thank all of you for your input. This, uh, you know, as you may or may not know, this has been uh, very... A lot of unbillable hours, especially for our associates. So, um, you know, thank you very much for, for the hard work and dedication. Yeah. So in case the microphones were off for, for our people on Zoom, there was a pause in the room. We could see it. We just couldn't hear it. Um, I'll just say, you know, uh, once again, thank you everyone for joining us for the session. Uh, on a personal note, you know, it has been um, a unique experience to be a part of this drafting committee, and I look forward to seeing uh, the final product once it's published. Uh, please, uh, you know, uh, follow the developments with the guidelines. For us, it's really critical to have the input of uh, the arbitration community of yourselves uh, so that the guidelines can become a truly useful document and a document that is used in practice. That's really the goal of this initiative. Uh, so thank you for your very insightful questions today. Yeah, thank you and feel free to reach out to us, also to any of us um, by email or to join the RBCD community. Um, we, would, we, we very much enjoy discussing the guidelines and, and any development with, with you, so thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone for being. I, I did want to, 
two things. First of all, thank you very much to Freshfields for hosting us. Thank you, Valerio. Thank you, Vasuda. Um, I saw Mate and uh, Noah. So thank you very much for hosting us. Uh, and as mentioned earlier by Dimitri, even though the final versions of the draft, the 2.0 will come out soon, we will continuously work on them. So any comments, any questions, please email us at AI, AI Task Force at svamc.org. Thank you.